heard about you long before we met. You're winsome and you're young, at least that's what they said. Well, now that the uh, the long road trip from Austria and Hungary is kind of over and most of the teams are back, I gather for one of the Formula 2 teams it was 17 hours door to door from Budapest to back to England. I better not say what part of England because it might give them away and drop them in it. But um, yeah, three or four minivans in convoy, a bit like the old mid 60s Formula 3 days, the Formula 3 caravan days. Uh, but, you know, it's great that they managed to put on all those races and, and everybody, hats off to Liberty, the FIA, everybody, all the teams, the marshals, the officials, the volunteers who made that triple header happen. We have two races coming up at Silverstone, of course, uh, after a free weekend. Not much time for a breather, but for the teams, it's um, it was absolutely exhausting three weeks, no doubt about that. And my first thought looking back at Hungary is to think again about that um, the penalty that Haas incurred for having both their drivers go from intermediates to slicks on the formation lap coming into the pit lane. Now that was all because the it's the formation lap that's the critical thing here. And this goes back to the whole driver aids thing of banning driver aids. It goes back to the Nico Rosberg lap of being driven around the lap by the engineer and told what settings to have on the car, what to do here, what to do there. And there was a big outcry at the time about it's getting out of hand. We've got to get back to raw racing, real racing drivers who just do things out of feel and naturally. That's what we want. Of course, there's loophole in that. And in any way, in any event, I always felt it was a slightly spurious thing because here we have this incredible technology on the cars. It's 2020. Ultimately, a racing driver still has to drive the car. And to me, what Nico Rosberg was doing was actually pretty cool. But anyway, they banned it all or tried to ban it all. And it was the formation lap was one of the focus areas because it's on the formation lap, but you can tell the driver what clutch settings to run, how many burnouts to do, get the brakes up to temperature, all the things that a driver perhaps should be feeling rather than being told by data. So they stopped all communication like that and instructions on the formation lap. And guess what? When a Kevin Magnussen or a Romain Grandjean trying to be a real racing driver says to his engineer, hey, the groove is pretty dry. I think I can come in, put some slicks on. Let's do it now, which is a great call, a typical motor racing call of the type we want in Formula One. And the team responds, OK, we're ready for you. Put the slicks on. That's considered to be illegal, but they got their penalty. I think that that will change and that you should be allowed to come in and do it and have that sort of conversation. It may not, but I think that's to the detriment of the sport because it'll, it'll put off some teams making on the spot decisions like that. And that's what we want in motor racing. It's what Formula One racing is indeed all about. That was one thing, and I hope that that doesn't happen again, that penalty doesn't happen again. And I think Haas should be applauded for taking the plunge and doing what they're doing. As I said in the video, it wasn't just a question of, oh, well, they had nothing to lose, because I think Ferrari should have had at least one, if not two cars on slicks. Certainly McLaren should have done so. You know, cars at the front, this was not, oh, we got nothing to lose. It is, let's think laterally here. We've got a driver who is capable of driving on slicks on a damp track. He's not gonna hit too many curbs. I mean, you wouldn't take that risk with say, Albon, I wouldn't have thought. But you could have a go with Lando on that one. And you could certainly have a go with Charles Leclerc and Sebastian Vettel. They're quite capable of keeping the car on the island. But that's, you know, that's the way I've always thought about racing. And um, I don't think I'm alone in that. Obviously, a lot of Formula One people uh, engineers, that is, on the pit wall, think very differently. Anyway, that was one thing. The, the other was I don't think we should underplay how good a job Red Bull did <laughs> to repair Max's car on the grid. I don't think we should give Max a hard time. I've seen Fernando Alonso spin when he's behind the safety car, warming up the tires. Not safety car, behind, on the, yeah, on the formation lap anyway, uh, the Nürburgring. Uh, David Coulthard, I think, spun coming into the pit lane once at Monza. You know, the, these things happen. People do embarrassing things. But, that is, but, but I do think for Max, though, I hadn't thought enough about it, but imagine what Max must have felt when he pulled up, monosyllabic, didn't really want to say very much. It was pretty obvious what had happened. Gets out of the car and then has to go down for the pre-race ceremonies. Uh, and he's thinking, I've got probably the whole team now working on my car at a time when they're absolutely shattered at the end of a triple header. And it was all my fault. This is not what they're expecting. And from the team's point of view, if they are late by one second, the car doesn't start and there goes their Grand Prix. So massive pressure 
on everybody, on Max and on, but particularly, of course, on the team. And to see those guys at Red Bull do it, we couldn't see that much. It was just a mass of, of mechanics there, wasn't it? Both sides of the garage, everybody working. But it wasn't a scramble. It was really, really well organized. And all credit to Jonathan Wheatley and everybody there, because um, that is even better than watching a two-second pit stop, I think. It was just brilliant to watch. And let's, let's list the things, because we now know what they had to change. And bear in mind here, they're in full view of the pit lane and, of course, the world's TV cameras. They've got to change a push rod, a track rod, an upright bracket, and then all the fairings and little deflectors and brake bits that have to come off in order for them to get to all those broken bits, replace the broken bits, and then put all those other fiddly bits back on the car. And they did all of that in under 15 minutes. Just brilliant to watch. Almost better than the Grand Prix itself. Speaking of which, <clears throat> one of the best races I've seen for a long time was the sprint race on the Sunday in Hungary because this is a race which, in which pit stops are not mandatory, but interestingly enough, most of the teams and the data showed that the quickest way, and most of the teams went along with this, to win that race was to make a pit stop because the degradation on the Pirelli medium tire, now in 18 inch rim form, was very, very high. So it was quicker, assuming there were no real dramas with traffic, etc., to make that pit stop. So that's what most of the teams did, including Callum Eilert, the Prima driver, English driver, very good ex-Rob Wilson guy, who was on the pole, interestingly, for both races. He qualified on the pole for the feature race, good lap in the wet, very good lap finished 10th due to various dramas, which put him on the pole for the sprint race as well. We need to get Sean Kelly to see how many drivers have actually had the pole for both races, bearing in mind it's a reverse grid for the second race. Anyway, putting that to one side, Callum Eilert looked to be the, the winner. He led from the start. He made his pit stop on the planned, at the planned moment and was coming quickly through the field. Mind you, there's Luca Giotto in the high-tech Formula 2 car. Bear in mind, high-tech's a brand new Formula 2 team. We interviewed Ollie Oakes a little bit earlier this year about it. And there's Luca Giotto, who's won races, of course, in F2 before, and he's very experienced, knows what he's doing. And he does an Artem Markelov iSport type deal, perfect tire management, doesn't make the pit stop and beats Callum to the line by, I don't know, uh, just enough to win the race, basically. If it had gone one more corner, it would have been Callum's race. So it was just fabulous. And, and um, you know, I thought, wow, that is amazing. And then on the podium, who do we see? We see Gav Jones there on the podium. And then all of it fits into place. Because, of course, Gav Jones is the engineer who used to be at iSport when Markelov was doing his thing, then went to Virtuoso when Luca was doing really well there. And now, over the winter, Ollie hired Gav Jones to work at High Tech. Mr. Tire Management Engineer is there with the driver. I'm sure that he had some influence in selecting with, with the new High Tech team, Luca Giotto, and look at it. So that's what, the sixth race in the life of the High Tech Formula 2 team, and they pull off a win like that. That is just all credit, I think, to Gav. And no wonder Ollie put him on the podium. It was quite funny at the end of the race to see Gav looking very sheepish on the podium, um, very embarrassed because he's that sort of guy. Lovely, lovely man. Anyway, here's Ollie, just a very short clip of Ollie when I spoke to him earlier this year about building up to the new F2 operation and then his decision to hire Luca Giotto. He doesn't mention Gav Jones, of course. Luca fitted the bill sort of perfectly. I think he'd, you know, he'd obviously been well looked after last year with Vertioso, with Zoo to bring sort of him on and you know they they were a strong partnership uh, at the end of last year and for us I think what I also needed was someone who I felt with the two drivers would work well together and obviously one being Russian one being Italian they're not both British and want to beat each other <laughs> they're quite good at bringing the team on and it's quite uh, odd in F2 but I'm sure having spoken to drivers who've done it you've understood that depending what team they've come from, they've got a weird expectation of sort of how the team should operate. And, you know, there's this massive thing up and down the F2 grid as to each team's philosophy on setup and tyre degradation. And to be truthful, I just wanted someone who I knew would work with us as a new team, but also who could really help us get on top of things quickly. And here's Gab. I caught him just as he walked through the door back in England after his long minivan trek back from Budapest. And, uh, and I asked him about the race. It was always going to be a close one once we saw the day going race one. And, and if we did the strategy calculations, it actually came out where a pit stop was very slightly better by about three or four seconds, taking no overtaking into account or anything. So we had a, 
a, a plan B that, that lap 17 was the sweet spot to do the stop and we had to commit then and we asked Luca at that time and he said he thought he could manage the tyres and we were second to Callum anyway so we were only going to come second probably and then he made the pit stop so that's when we decided to let's go long and uh, see at, at worst we'll probably end up second so uh, uh, but there's a there's always a sniff of a chance of winning and he did a fantastic job to look after the tyres one little mistake on the last lap which gave us a bit of a heart attack which lost a couple of seconds but um, yeah just managed to hold Callum off and you know made a great race for everyone I think wet dry or damp or you know the high deg tyres it, it always gives you a chance to do something other than just watch 22 cars go around nose to tail trying to pass on DRS you know it, it it gives you a little bit of something extra and you still need the driver to deliver they've got to be careful on the tyres I mean there was no rubber left at the end of the race he'd used everything but uh, it, it, it worked out you know and, and Maz did a great job He we did a pit stop with him because he was in a bit more traffic and he, he came through to a strong fifth to follow up his his uh, first podium the day before so a good weekend really Changing the subject a little what, what did you think about the Formula 1 teams that didn't take the option of running at least one, if not both cars on slicks at the start of the Hungarian Grand Prix. We had a similar situation with our uh, race and, and we, we sent the drivers out on the install laps on slicks and said, look, it might be a bit wet, but let's get some heat in the tyres and at least you'll find out because quite often you're surprised that there's a bit more grip than you think. And the, the, they both were in two minds, but you know, we, we sort of forced them into it. And as it turned out, most other people did the same and we were sort of packing up so I, I didn't see too much of the F1 and then I noticed it was wet and then I thought I can't believe no one's trying anything on slicks it, it, it did seem strange but they've got their own ideas on strategies and things obviously the Haas went on it but, but did it by uh, I don't know the full detail but a radio instruction which wasn't allowed because it was the formation lap or something so which is a bit of a shame because at least they took a chance. <laughs> I, w I wouldn't want to criticise from the outside because I know what it's like when you're in the middle of it. Um, you know, that it's very easy with hindsight glasses on to, to, to win every race, really. But <laughs> I'm sure they have their own reasons. But I, 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 I would have been inclined, I think, to send at least one round on slicks and, and um, you know, have, have a... Uh, not all your eggs in one basket, really. Well, the difference is, of course, you have the track record, so you can say that. Yeah, yeah, I think uh, as it's got to where it's got, you know, so many people involved making decisions, it, it, it does make those sort of seat of the pants decisions a bit harder for people to make because the, they have to be accountable and there has to be a, a flow of information for making decisions, but sometimes there isn't that time to make that flow of information and it's nice in a smaller team to be able to uh, take the chance and say look let's do this and let's go for it and and if it doesn't work out at the end hold your hand up and be prepared to uh, be booted out <laughs> you can't deny the fact that you are